I want to hear you say yes loudly, okay? Yeah. I didn't ask. <laughs> Mark, we're going to decrease your pay. <laughs> Do you love your church family? Yeah. Okay, let's try a little bit louder. Do you love your church family? Yeah. Okay, sounds great. I also want you to do something else since everyone loved it so much. I actually want everyone to look in the right corner over there real quick and say, Happy birthday, Aaron. Someday we're going to take over Kevin's spot. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> you know, this past week I had a pretty good conversation with Jimbo over there, Jim Arnett. We were drinking some coffee and we were talking a little bit and he's, we were talking and he said a statement that I really appreciated and it was from a passage of scripture and he said, you know what, the wisdom in man is foolishness to God. And isn't that true? Yes. You know, one of the things that I often do is I often look at the world and what the world's teaching and what the world is saying, and I often think, you know what, I want to think about what the opposite of what they're thinking and saying and doing is, because you probably get a clearer picture of what God is thinking and wanting and doing. And I think about the world, and we're, we're seeing that so much nowadays. But one of the philosophies that this world has taught is to say the purpose and the priority and the desire that each person should have in their lives is the process of trying to get other people to be their servants. And we keep this at a very young age. Get a good education, be popular, make a lot of money, and have people serve you. But if we take this mentality of saying, you know what, the wisdom of man is foolishness to God, what if we flip that? Because in reality, in God's perspective, we should be spending our time and our heart and our devotion to not seeking people to serve us, but us to be like the great servant, Jesus Christ, which means, how can I serve other people? You know, the older we get every year, we should be serving more and more people in our lives. Because when we are young, we think it's all about me. What can I accomplish in this world for myself? Where in reality, from God's perspective, it has always been about other people. This whole year, we have spent talking about the theme of being a servant. Serving and sacrifice. And one of our overarching things that we're trying to accomplish here in the church is trying to be true disciples of Jesus. What does it actually mean to follow Jesus? What does it actually mean to be like Jesus and to follow his teachings? Because in following Jesus, we know that Jesus was a servant. And so the rest of our lives, as part of our discipleship, as following Jesus Christ, we should be spending and saying, how can I be a servant just like Jesus Christ was and is? Because that should be how we should be growing. There's different ways to gauge spiritual maturity. This morning in Bible class, I talked about how one vantage point of spiritual maturity is whether or not God is reigning in your heart more and of your heart today than he did yesterday. And another aspect of spiritual maturity is, am I more of a servant today than I was yesterday? And that's a whole way, different way of thinking. And this is what God is calling us to do. This whole year I've spent teaching and preaching about being a servant. Our Bible classes, we've been emphasizing that. In our ministries, we've been emphasizing that. 
And this is not the only year in which we're going to do service. This was a year where we focus on service in order to say, for the rest of my life, I have now known what it means to be a servant of Jesus, and from now on, I'm going to serve him. And I'm going to serve others in the name of Christ. Because there is no greater calling or purpose. You know, one of the things that we're going to see today is that Christ invested in his apostles, his disciples, to teach them to be like him. And it was the process of learning to think less of themselves and more of other people and learning what it means to be a servant. Part of what we're going to be covering today is what I hope will, exp will happen in, in your life, what you will experience. And so one of the things that I thought about was this. How many of you like to watch movies? Okay, I like to watch movies. But have you ever seen that the, the really good movies are well done, you know, they're well written, they're well acted, they're well produced, they're well, well directed. But one of the great things that came out over the last few decades were these things called bonus features. And in the bonus features, what do you do? You, you go on there and you see a lot of other things. You see these things called bloopers. And have you ever enjoyed watching the bloopers on this? Like, they'll be doing a serious scene and then someone starts cracking up laughing and everyone starts laughing and they made a big mistake and then they do it over and over again. Or other times in the behind the scenes where someone will forget their lines and then everyone else will be laughing. You know, if, if you watch the behind the scenes, you see there was a lot going on behind the scenes in making this movie. It wasn't completely perfect. It wasn't completely polished. It wasn't perfectly clean. But by the time it hit the big screen and you paid your money and you had your popcorn and you're eating it like you're starving, you know, and guzzling down that soda, which is bad for you, uh, and you're watching that movie, and then it's this perfect thing. You wouldn't have thought, hey, that actor missed his line the first time on the scene. Or that person didn't do what they were supposed to do on that scene. But their finished product was well done. You know, sometimes I think about what Christ is doing in our lives. And what Christ is doing is he's trying to make you that polished servant. So that the story in the movie of your life looks fantastic. The plot is good. God took this sinful person, saved them, and then they served him. That's the movie that God wants to produce in your life. And along that pathway, you're going to be making some bloopers. You're going to forget some lines. You're going to do some things. But the reason why God is constantly working with you is because he knows that those things are going to happen and he's teaching you. He's helping you go through this process so that the finished product is this godly, mature servant who will stand before God one day and God the Father will be able to look at you personally and individually and even collectively as the church here at Center Road and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You weren't perfect, but you matured. And God grew you through that process. One of the great things that we understand from Scripture is that Christ invested in flawed people. And he invested in them in order to make them servants. One of the great things that we read about and one of the themes that we see in the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to be in there today, is... In the Gospel of Luke, we see Jesus doing a lot of investment in his disciples. And in fact, one scholar said from Luke chapter 5 to Luke chapter 10, we see really Christ investing in his disciples. And he listed three things that kind of demonstrated the process by which Jesus actually helps grow in mature servants. And so what I want to do today is I want to pick a subsection from each of those passages to see how God is working in your life to make you into that final product, that mature person, the one who will stand before God one day and hear the most beautiful words you'll ever hear. Because when you hear God call you his servant, his good and faithful servant, 
I can guarantee you there will be no words sweeter to your ear that you have ever heard. But one of the first things that Christ did was this, the calling of the disciples. We kind of see Christ emphasizing this in Luke chapter 5 and 6. And so I'm not going to read all of chapter 5 and 6, but I want to do a subsection of this. And one of the great callings that we see in this passage is when Jesus called a man by the name of Levi, a man who is also known as Matthew. But just like Levi, God calls us. And one of the first things that Christ does when he's trying to grow in the church servants is one of the first things he does is call them. So let's look at how God, Christ called Levi. In Luke chapter 5, verse 27 through 32, it says this. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. The Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Do you know one of the reasons why I absolutely love this passage of Scripture? Because I love how Jesus called Levi. I want you to imagine for a moment that God told you to go plant a church somewhere. Let's say you don't know anybody, but you go into town, and who would you recruit to help you plant your church? And God said, go and look. Do you know what's interesting? Jesus went, and he found probably the most hated man in the town to help him start his church. Because he likes paying taxes. You know, unless you really do, I see all these people thinking, I like paying taxes. Yes, Big Brother's watching you. But one of the things is, you know, we think about this and we think, here is Levi, the most, one of the most hated guys probably in this town. He has a reputation for this, and he's a sinful person. And in fact, when Levi goes and he sets this banquet out for Jesus, and he's eating, and the Pharisees, the religious elite, the godly people in the town, they go up and they see what Jesus and his disciples are doing. They ask the question, why are you guys eating with them? Why are you eating with the tax collectors? Why are you eating with the sinners? Look about with Levi. Levi had the reputation of being a sinner. Levi had the reputation of fellowshipping with sinners, and Levi had a reputation of being hated. He was a tax collector. He was a traitor. But do you know what's interesting? The sinful, hated traitor of a man, Jesus looked at him and called him to be a servant. And he called him to be a leader within his church. In fact, one of the pillars of his church, one of his apostles. You know, one of the interesting things is when you look at your own life, when I ask you to serve or when God asks you to serve, or you read your Bible about service, one of the first things we always do is say, well, I can't do that. I'm not qualified to do that. How could I possibly do that? You want to know how and why? Because if Jesus walked into Kokomo, Indiana, he'd be looking for sinners to help him build his church. And how do I know this? Because he called you and he called me. You know, one of the interesting things is he called us, despite your past. But the, but the amazing thing was, Levi got up from his tax booth, and he followed the call. How many of you have heard the call of Christ, and he said, come and follow me. Be like me. Learn to be a servant like me. Because Matthew did. And for the rest of his life, he wasn't living the philosophy of this world that says, have people serve you. Levi was probably the richest of the apostles. If you don't count the apostle Paul. Because you had to be wealthy to be a tax collector because you had to pay for that privilege. But here's the thing. He left the tax booth. He accepted the call. 
God is calling all of you to be His servant today. God is calling you to say, come and follow me, learn from me, and do what I do. And that's serve. And, he, and despite your past, you can say, well, look at my sin, look at my inadequacies. Christ would say, guess what? I'm the great physician. I came to heal you. I called you to repentance, and I made you new. Do you understand that God called you? You are here for a reason. So are you going to leave your booths to follow? So that's the first thing. When Christ calls, they accept it. The second thing that Christ does is that he equips servants. He equips servant disciples. We see this in Luke chapter 7 and 8. And we see him doing a lot of teaching and miracles. And what he's doing is he's demonstrating and teaching them what it means to follow him. What it means to be a servant. And here's the amazing thing is God doesn't just call you to do his will. God actually gives you what you need to accomplish God's will. We all know that God gave us spiritual gifts. We know that God gave us the Word of God. We know that God gave us each other, the church. But one of the great things that Christ gave us was Himself and the knowledge of who He is. The greatest equipping that Christ has actually given you beyond your spiritual giftedness, beyond your talents, beyond your intelligence, is Himself. And one of the great lessons that he was teaching his disciples in order to equip them for service and ministry and mission was the knowledge of who he was. So I'm going to read this passage from the segment where Jesus is equipping his servants in chapter 7 and 8. This is pulled from Luke chapter 8, verse 22 to 25. It says, One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith? he asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water. And they obeyed him. I want you to think about that for a moment. Why, why did Jesus do this? Why was he willing to go out in the water? Didn't he know a squall was going to come? I mean, he controls nature, obviously. Well, how could he fall asleep when the storm was going on? You know, everything that Jesus did was on purpose. Even sleeping. And so they woke him up. And he rebuked them. Because one of the things that he was trying to equip them with was faith. And not just faith, but faith in who he is. Because if you ask the question, who is this? You'd know the answer is, this is the Son of God. The Son of God! If he can control the winds and the waves, then he will bam! You know, it's wintertime right now, and all of a sudden, you know, if God wanted, He can make it summertime outside. Or it might be a snowstorm later on. It's Indiana. You know, one of those things. But one of the things that Christ equipped us with was the knowledge of who He is. So one of the best ways to equip yourself for service is saying, Who is Jesus? I want to learn more about Him. How can I love Him? How can I fear Him? How can I worship Him? How can I serve Him? Because the more we grow in knowledge and understanding of who He is, that is the core of growing our faith. And when our faith grows, faith moves us to serve. And when faith moves us to serve, we become the servants Christ has called us to be. So when, when Christ calls us to serve, first of all, we say, yes, we accept the call. But the second thing we do is we ask ourselves, am I being equipped? Am I being equipped by growing in faith in the knowledge of Jesus Christ? On a daily basis, do I pray to God and say, God, I want to know your son more? 
because the more I realize that he is the son of God who came into this world, into the flesh, spoke the word, got on the cross, rose again, rose in heaven, and will one day come back for those who served him, that will equip us to do things that are what we think is impossible. This whole year, you have 53 opportunities of sermons to hear about service. God has equipped you. And in this year, you've had classes and ministry opportunities to be equipped, to know Jesus better together and individually so that we can serve. God has equipped you. Are you taking advantage of knowing Christ better? On a daily basis, are you opening your Bible and getting on your knees in prayer and saying, God, I want to know your son more because I want to be the servant he is. When you look at the opportunities that church leadership offers you with our Bible classes and with our Bible studies and with our life groups, do you say, you know, I could be sitting on the couch watching TV or I could know your son more. Do you say, I want that? Because the way we're going to be equipped and grow in service is by growing in faith in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you just love him. You know, last night it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was just singing praises of God, and I was just saying, thank you, God, for letting me know your son, Jesus. You know, one of my favorite things when I talk with Jim, every time I talk with Jim, Jim says, one of the things I can't wait for is one day when we get into the realm of eternity and I get to hug Jesus. I just love that picture. Why? Because you get to be, have a relationship with the Son of God. And when you, so you, you have had this whole year to add to your discipleship, to be equipped. So for the rest of your life, you need to be a servant. And then we see this one. This is the challenging one. The sending of the servant disciples. This is where, in Luke chapter 9 and 10, this is where God, Christ says, okay, I called you. I equipped you. Now go. And that's one of the hard parts is sometimes we just want to remain in the called section. Sometimes we just want to be remain in the equipped section. But Christ doesn't just call and equip you for no reason. He calls and equips you in order to say, go. And go do it. And you know what? When he calls you to serve, it's going to be hard. People will hate you. And you've got to be all right with that. People are going to criticize you. You've got to be okay with that. People are going to complain against you. And it's even worse when they're not doing things. But you've just got to be all right with that. You're going to sacrifice. You're going to be tired. You're going to give. Those are all just facts. Because those are the things Jesus did. He was tired when he went to the cross. He was criticized. He was hated. And ultimately, he died. That might even be our fate one day. But we're going to go. Because we know, as Mark said very well in the first song, this isn't our home. We're on our way to Zion. And when we say go, we're, we're, we're going out and we're trying to take as many people with us to Zion. But look at how... Jesus sends out his disciples, and he's going to tell them, I'm sending you out, I equipped you, it's going to be hard, people are going to hate you, but do it anyways. This is in Luke chapter 10, verse 1 through 20. It says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of them to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Doesn't sound too great, but he sends them. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is offered to you. Hear the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near you. 
that we will enter a town and are not welcome, go into the street to say, even the dust of your town will wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it would be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Corazon. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it would be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. I tell you, it would be... And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You know, this was a commission that Christ sent some of his disciples. He had called them, he had equipped them, and then he was giving them a ministry training opportunity to say, okay, go and preach, go perform miracles, go and do this. And they went out and they did and he didn't shoot the cardi. He says, I'm sending you out like lambs to wolves. You're being sent out to like lambs to wolves. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. But guess what? If we are faithful, if we will go, and if we are bold, and if we will teach, and if we will serve, we'll be able to return with joy just as the disciples did and say, Christ, we're joyful. We served. I can't wait for the day when Jesus will say, you know what? I saw what you did, Peggy. I saw what you did, Melissa. I saw what you did, Lisa. Guess what? Satan fell. And he fell because you served. So take joy in that. And guess what? When we serve, we're more powerful than demons. Christ proved that. So I want you to think about this. This whole year, God has spent developing you to grow in your service. But I want to ask you, have you taken up the call and say, here am I, send me, I'll serve? Have you taken the opportunities to grow in knowledge of Jesus Christ, be equipped as a servant? And then have you accepted the call to go? I want you to think of this imagery for a moment. If Jesus came into Kokomo and walked in our church building and offered up ministry opportunities, who do you think he would ask first in this church? And you know that that person in the church would say yes. If that person isn't you, change that. I want, without a shadow of doubt, if Christ came in here and said, I need this, we would be fighting over and say, I want to be that one. And I'll fight in tooth and nail. Well, I'll beat you. Even though you're stronger than me. <laughs> Conquer death. You know. But one of the things I want you to think about is I want you to truly, truly want to serve. This last week I sent out ministry opportunities. Next year we're going to be offering ministry opportunities. How many of you will say, I'll go? It'll be hard. I probably will be criticized. I will be sacrificing. But if the kids need a teacher, I'll teach. I won't use the excuse, my time was over, my kids are grown. Because Christ doesn't give up and say, well, I died on the cross, my work is done. He's still there with you. Or people will say, we need help with the teenagers. They say, well, I don't have a teenager. Or we need someone to help with communion or cleaning, say, I'll clean the toilets. Nothing is too good for us because we're servants. And we say, I want to be the one to serve. So for the rest of this year and next year and for the rest of your life, since we spent this whole year dedicated to growing as disciples who are truly servants of Jesus Christ, let's follow his example. Let's be the servants and let's be eager with joy to serve. And let's cause Jesus another reason to rejoice and say, Satan fell because of your 
service. At this time, if you want us to serve you by praying for you, let us serve you in that way. And if today you want Christ to serve you by washing your sins away, and you want to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, we give you the opportunity to come forward now as we stand and sing. What can